everyone. I'm Harpreet Singh, welcoming you to the Future of Work Pioneers podcast. Today, we are speaking with Mary Morland, the Executive Vice President of Human Resources at Abbott. In her important role, she advocates on behalf of Abbott employees around the world, from those on the manufacturing lines to scientists working on breakthrough inventions. She has a background in actuarial science and earned a Bachelor of Arts in Applied Math and Economics from Harvard University. Maddie, welcome to the show. Thanks, it's great to be here. So let's start with your background. Um, tell us what got you interested in HR and any defining moments that uh, brought you to this role. Well, as you noted, I probably don't have the, uh, the obvious path as a, a, for an HR executive. I studied economics and math, I became an actuary, and I was a consultant to, uh, to uh, large companies for about 20 years. I love the work, but most of all, I love the company that I worked for. We had a really strong culture of servant leadership. And of course, in consulting, you understand very easily the importance of people because you're selling expertise, you don't have products. And that culture that values training and developing was really critical. This made a strong impression on me and any defining moments that shaped my career were really involving culture. After about two, day, two decades, I was ready for a change and from consulting and I joined Abbott, which happened to be my favorite client. I, I, was, uh, I joined in HR, I was the leader of our total rewards function. I was attracted to Abbott because what I saw from them as a consultant was also a very strong servant leadership culture. After nine years, I was given the privilege of leading our HR function for our 109,000 employees in 160 countries around the world. That focus from culture on my early career is even more important to me now. I believe HR is the keeper of the culture. It's up to us to ensure that our culture is clear and apparent throughout the company. It's the glue that keeps us together all around the world. And at Abbott, our strong culture comes through our values, pioneering or innovating, relentless achieving, caring, both for those who use our products and for those who make them and who develop them. And then finally, enduring, which is ensuring that we can continue to be successful both through our products and through our people. Our company is over 130 years old. Last year, Robert Ford became only our 13th CEO in our history. All 13 have been appointed from within the company. That's a testament to a culture that values and develops people. And it's also a clear expectation of what we in HR have to live up to, which is a tradition of strong internal development of successful leaders. You've touched upon culture as a, a central element here. How do you think about building such a culture and uh, what are the ingredients uh, that are important in your, uh, from, from your perspective? So it all goes back to our values. Those values permeate our company. And as I think about our culture, that's the most important, uh, those are the most important keystones for us. How do we create a, a, a culture of innovation? We hire scientists who have strong skills, who are always looking for the next breakthrough. For uh, achieving, we set, we set uh, intense, uh, we have high expectations of ourselves and then we expect to meet, meet those, those stretch targets. Caring is really an important value for, for us in HR, making sure that we're treating our employees the right way, making sure that they have the opportunities that they need both for themselves and for their families. And then finally, enduring, doing, and doing, enduring, doing everything that we can to think about the future and to make sure that what we are doing is building on a very strong tradition and making things better for the future. Abbott was uh, recently named by Fortune as one of the top uh, 100 best workplaces for diversity. Uh, what initiatives have been introduced to foster this commitment toward inclusivity and building such an environment for all employees? So diversity is just is in our DNA and it's fundamental at Abbott. It really starts with our diversified business model and it continues into our mindset and our people. It's core to fulfilling our purpose and it's embedded in our values and key, we believe, to our long-term success. We strive to create the kind of environment where every employee can feel welcome and can feel that they can be themselves at work. This means a cre creating a culture and just a way of doing business where every person feels valued, they feel respected, and they understand how what they're doing 
is core to our purpose. Because we're a business that helps people around the world, we also want to ensure that the diversity we see globally is reflected in our workforce. So we've integrated diversity, equity, and inclusion across our businesses and into the way that we do business. We make diversity and inclusion education resources and training programs available to all Abbott employees on topics like unconscious bias, inclusive leadership, and how to be an ally. Nearly 10,000 of our employees are participating in our employee resource, resource groups. They're open to all of, our, all of our employees. We have targeted mentoring, training, and development programs to support career advancements for diverse employees. And we actively partner with historically black colleges and universities to recruit talent. And about 30 years ago, we helped found a nonprofit called Advancing Minorities Interests in Engineering, which aims to increase diversity in the engineering workforce. But looking ahead, we're focused on the lack of global STEM talent. Part of our 2030 sustainability plan, we plan to provide opportunities for more than 100,000 young people, 50% of them from underrepresented groups to participate in our STEM programs and our high school and our college STEM internships. And, and what do these programs look like? So our, our um, so a few years ago, 2012, we created a high school STEM internship program. And the goal there was to um, start the development of STEM talent early in a career. So we found uh, students who were interested in a STEM career and uh, with the intent of creating a diverse talent pipeline, but starting it very early. And so we wanted to offer meaningful quality STEM, STEM experiences, no matter what the backgrounds, and in the process, increase the diversity of our own STEM talent pipeline. The program's success has actually exceeded our, our expectations. We continue to track students who participated in the program. And remember, they started in high school, but 97% of them go on to pursue STEM degrees in college. The past summer, 70% of the students in the program were from diverse backgrounds. We've started our first for hiring our first former interns as full-time engineers, which I just, I've been really passionate about. So these are people who started with us in high school and we identified a strong STEM talent. They've come back generally for several, several internships during college, and now they are full-time engineer employees. 73% of them are female or from underrepresented backgrounds. And we do all of this because we know that there, there is a global shortage of, of STEM talent today. And as an actuary, I'll, I'll share a statistic with you that uh, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics projects that we'll need nearly 800,000 more STEM jobs by 2029. So that won't just affect Abbott, that will affect the entire globe. So we want to, we, uh, because of this, and we're so passionate about it, last year we published our blueprint for our high school program so that other companies could leverage our learnings and create their own programs so as to help fill that need by 2029. Uh, I think the longevity of uh, engagement that you have with these students is very admirable. Mm -hmm. it, yes, and it's, and it's great for us because we know that those students who know us better and who come into our organization as full-time employees, having some knowledge of the, the breadth of our businesses are going to be successful and are going to grow into great leaders for us someday. This episode is brought to you by Experfy. Incubated in Harvard Innovation Lab, Experfy provides custom future of work solutions, such as private talent clouds and skill taxonomies. Experfy differentiates itself by using subject matter experts to pre-vet and pipeline candidates for AI and high-end technology skills. However, Experfy Talent Cloud Platform is skill agnostic and can be licensed to build custom talent clouds for any and all skills. In a different use case, enterprises interested in employee intermobility can license the Expropy platform to create an internal gigs marketplace where interested employees can be algorithmically matched to projects, gamifying their learning experience. Visit www.expropy.com for more information. Interestingly, Abbott has performed uh, 300,000 tests for COVID-19 nationwide. 
uh, part of this is having your U.S. employees tested weekly for the virus. Mm -hmm. You have also uncovered that seven out of 10 workers that tested positive were asymptomatic. Uh, how has frequent testing in your workplace affected your employees' morale in returning to work? So we've performed since the summer 300,000 tests in the U.S. just on our own employees. But our mission is to help people create, to live their healthiest, best lives. And that goes for uh, those who use our products, that goes for our customers, and that absolutely is true for our employees. So if you go back to last March, when the, everything was closing down, we knew we had employees who couldn't work remotely. We needed them in our labs to, to do research and development. We needed them producing products. So we quickly created a protocol to ensure that we had a, the healthiest possible workplace for those who, who didn't have the luxury of working remotely. And that included wearing masks and social distancing and, and enhanced, uh, enhanced cleaning protocols. At the same time, because we know that we are better and stronger when we're all together, we started a team in April focused on what could we do to bring employees back to the office? What would that look like? For both of those groups, employee testing was always a part of our plan. We knew our scientists would be developing tests that would be appropriate for widespread workplace deployment, whether in our offices or in our manufacturing facilities. So we had scientists working round the clock focused on creating tests. And we had a small team thinking, once we have the tests, how will we deploy this among, among, across our sites? And we really were focused on that because it was another level of protection, but also a level of peace of mind for, for our employees. The testing process is really simple, not stressful, not complicated at all. I actually, uh, I had my test this morning. It takes longer for me to walk from my office to the testing site and back than it does to actually perform the test. So basic process is I go into the testing center, I show my Abbott Navica app that identifies me. Um, there's a QR code that, uh, that identifies the individual. So they scan that QR code, a nurse hands, hands a swab, the swab's like a Q-tip with a long, a long handle. You swab your nose, it's not painful, it's not the put it all the way up in your nose, it's just around, the, around your nose. You hand it back to the nurse, you leave. And then about 15 minutes later, the test result, um, for me, fortunately, always negative, shows up on your Navica app, and that acts as a pass to grant me access to the building for the next week. It's unlike anything that's ever been done before. And the whole focus of our effort was to help our employees, both at work and at life, just like many other programs that we, that we do. It has absolutely brought uh, peace of mind to our workers and not even just the workers, but there's a comfort in for the family in knowing that the workers are being tested. Um, one great example is Mary, Mary Rogers. Mary is a scientist in a diagnostics division. Ironically, she's been working on COVID test deployment, but uh, she tested positive during just a general weekly employee testing process. She has no idea how she contracted the virus, but she's so grateful that she knew that she that, uh, that she was positive because it allowed her to quickly quarantine and protect her husband who has a heart condition and their small children. Can you share uh, some key findings from the data that you're collecting from running these frequent tests? So we started last summer, we, we had, we're testing at two sites, we tested 2000 employees a week. We're now up to 25,000 employees a week at more than 50 sites in eight countries. And every week we're adding new, new sites and new countries. Our positivity rate has been less than a half percent. We've averaged about 0.4 over that entire time, which is really low, but it speaks to the effectiveness of the frequent testing and the focus on being able to identify those people who, who are positive and uh, enable them to quarantine. You mentioned the asymptomatic cases. I find that the most, most fascinating. When I talk with people, that's what's uh, really interesting. Seven out of 10 people who test positive have no symptoms. Those are exactly the people we're, we want to find because they don't know that, that they have the virus. They don't know they're contagious, but they could, be, they could be spreading the virus at home and at work. So they're the ones that we want to quickly identify and quarantine so that they, they are able to keep the virus uh, to themselves and, and, and not share it. We plan to continue to keep to make testing available to, uh, after the vaccine is widely available as well. We, we don't have any plans to end it at this time. 
I, the way I think about it is it's just like, just as with a flu test, I think COVID tests are going to be with us for the long haul. It, it, all, it seems like uh, you have a playbook uh, for, for companies that want to think about bringing people back to work. And uh, so, so, so the CHROs out there who, who are grappling with this sort of a decision uh, and want to bring their employees back, what would you suggest they do? You know, I, th I think we, we learned during the pandemic that we can work remotely, but I don't think that we, certainly from my perspective, it's not the best way to work. It's not easy to collaborate. You can't have the hallway conversations. You don't have the meeting after the meeting. So we really wanted to bring our employees back to the office so that we could provide an, or, an environment where our organization works best and where our employees can experience a bit of normalcy in their daily lives in the midst of so much that's, that's not normal. From a cultural perspective, we're, we know we're better when we collaborate. We know we benefit from unplanned interactions. It's what makes us human and that's what that takes our performance to a higher level. We also learned in the pandemic just how social we really are. And what we, we learned most of all that when we can't have human interaction, we crave it even more than usual. And from my perspective, it's just very difficult to develop talent from afar. You need to sit next to someone. You need to be in a meeting with someone. Even if you're six feet apart, that's better than trying to do something over a screen. So every workplace is different. Everyone needs to have their own protocols. But what we've learned along the way that the combination of the frequent testing, masking, social distancing, temperature checks has really made an impact on our organization. So in the end, I would just encourage organizations to push themselves to go back to the office. Don't be lulled into this concept that it's, it's just as good as it was before, because I think most of us know in our hearts of hearts, it's really not. I think it's critical for innovation, for personal and professional development, for our culture, and for just returning to a sense of normalcy through social interactions. Let's talk about uh, reskilling and upskilling. Uh, you have a vibrant uh, internship program focused on STEM, but what are you doing for your own employees? So we've, uh, so as we think about our 2030 sustainability plan, one of the pillars is focused on reskilling our workers. And that is an important pillar to us because as we look to the future and the future of healthcare and the workers that we're going to need, all we see is change. We see innovation. Think about the innovations that we're focused on today with healthcare um, wearables. We, you know, I, our Apple Watch tells us all sorts of things about us. Um, think about just the change over the last year with telehealth and the embracing of telehealth, both by patient and by doctor. And going forward, we talk about smart bodies, how technologies can provide people with real-time insights to manage, prevent, and, and even predict health conditions. But all of that is about innovation. So that means that our workforce and their skills are going to be fluid and we're going to have to continue to be ready to upskill and reskill those employees. We, uh, that's why we put this focus for our, in, for our 2030 sustainability plan. We want to take 50% of our targeted new jobs and fill them with internal talent by upskilling, by cross-skilling and by creating learning opportunities. The goal is to take great Abbott employees today and make sure that they retain, remain great Abbott employees for the future. And we've, we've done this already in a few places. So for example, if you think about that high school internship program, the, the skills that those students needed when they were in high school are very different than the skills that they need eight years later when they become full-time engineers. We've, wor we've, we've worked with them to make sure that they can keep up on those skills. Another great example is in Ireland, we needed R&D engineers. We struggled to find them. We had great manufacturing engineers. So we created a program to take great manufacturing engineers and we've turned them into R&D engineers. So we're really excited about this because we've, we, we feel that it's going to address a really critical need for us. And we know that we have the expertise to be able to, to do it. So, so what are some of the other skills uh, that you see that there is a gap for? Uh, so R&D engineers is one, what, what else? I think just general STEM across the board. I could, I could point to many, many, many specifics, but it's really, um, and the combination of having STEM skills 
and having some business acumen and being able to really understand how the work that you're doing fits into the broader whole of the company or the product and, and taking the product itself to the next, to the next level um, and addressing those most pressing healthcare needs. Mm-hmm. And, and, and what are the mechanics being used to help people along this journey of upskilling or reskilling? Um, uh, uh, you know, are there online courses or, uh, are, you know, how are you thinking about the, the, uh, the, the actual mechanics? So I, it will be a combination of, uh, of, of all of those, but uh, for us, a lot will be on the job training. There'll certainly be some upfront classroom type training, be it online or, or in person, depending upon the role. But then a lot will just be working side by side with the person who has those skills to help you grow and develop just you know, kind of the, the, uh, the 70, 20, 10 uh, approach to learning that we all know. So as a global uh, health technology company, how do you see future work evolving in the coming years? I, so I, I, a lot will be around innovation and just changes and how we keep up with the changes and make sure that we have the, uh, the talent that we need both through building that strong diverse talent pipeline and also reskilling and upskilling uh, I, I'm not a believer in we don't need offices and we're all going to work remotely from our, our homes or wherever we, we want to be. I really firmly believe that as a, uh, we will find that we like being together, that we have better, we're better together. Uh, I just find myself when we're working remotely, just the, the normal act that I would have had of popping into someone's office now becomes a, I need to find them one way, on one technology or another. And I think over time, when we have more freedom to be together, we will want to be together. Our business leaders tell me all the time how much they want to travel, how much they need to go and meet with their teams on the ground, um, because that informs you in a different way than being across the screen. So, so I think a lot of the future of work will be a lot like, like it was in 2018 and 2019 and a lot less like 2020. Any parting words for our audience? Well, you know, I, I, I started by saying that uh, I think HR is the keeper of the culture. And from a cu- cultural perspective, we know we're always stronger when we're together. But that's why we created this successful employee testing program, which combined with the other precautions of mask wearing and, and social distancing has enabled us to get our employees back to the office. And across the board, I hear from them that that's given them a great sense of normalcy and I know that it has helped maintain our strong company culture. Thank you very much, Mary. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.